Good morning. This is a day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. I want to thank you for coming this day and want to welcome you here in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to thank Lori for her opening uh, ministry of music and those also the pre service of the uh, song service. I thank you for all those wonderful songs because there's never a wrong time to sing about Jesus and I love Christmas hymns actually joy to the world is something I think we can sing every day and we'd be so thankful for a redeeming savior and a God that loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son um, here we are at the end of July it's hard to believe summer is uh, two-thirds gone and school will be starting a couple uh, weeks and we'll be back to that thing of uh, work for those people that actually as young people and children the rest of us work all the summer. I used to be a school teacher, and I remember the, the joys of having those months off, but now I'm working all the time, so I don't have that. Anyway, today, as my thoughts went about what I might have a, a scripture or a call to worship, what I've always thought about is the word worship. And so I've chosen from John 4, 25 and 26, and basically it's the woman at the well, and Christ is going to her and basically saying if you knew who basic was this was who's speaking to you and speaking to the living water which he had because he was asking for a drink of the water of the well and that whole conversation went on but at the from 25 it reads and the hour cometh and is now when the true worshiper shall worship the father in spirit and truth for the father seeketh such to worship him for unto such has God promised his spirit and they who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. I know today we've all come prepared that we might worship God. And I'm sure that our brother Rick has prepared the message that flows on those lines of worshiping the king. It's something we need to do every day and be aware of those things. I'd like to read from the uh, seventh chapter of Genesis, 23rd through 25th verses. And the Lord called his people Zion because they were one heart and one mind and dwelt in righteousness and there were no poor among them. And Enoch continued his preaching in righteousness unto the people of God. And it came to pass that in his day that he built a city that was called the city of holiness, even Zion.
Continuing with the, uh, the thought from our scripture reading, I'd like to uh, continue reading in Genesis, this time in the, uh, the ninth chapter, 21st to the 25th verses. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant which I made unto thy father Enoch, that when men should keep all my commandments, Zion should again come on the earth, the city of Enoch, which I have caught up unto myself. And this is my everlasting covenant, that when thy posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy. And the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven and possess the earth, and shall have place until the end come. And this is my everlasting covenant, which I have made with thy father Enoch. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will establish my covenant with thee, which I have made between thee, me, and thee, for every living creature of all flesh that shall be upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and thee for all flesh that shall be upon the earth. I uh, had seriously looked at the, uh, the scripture that Scott used for uh, his call to worship about um, worshiping in spirit and in truth. And that's a, a scripture that I have uh, pondered and wondered about uh, for a long time. I think we understand what it means to worship in spirit, but I'm not so sure we have a real good grasp on what it means to worship in truth. Uh, is it uh, some special order of worship? Is it some special uh, words that we say that uh, is more acceptable to God than others? I believe that when it talks about worshiping in spirit and in truth, it is akin to uh, what James is telling us, telling us to be, be ye doers of the word and not just hearers. And that if we are just hearers of the word, we deceive ourselves. So how do we worship in truth? The, uh, the two scriptures that I've read so far have dealt with Zion, a literal, physical realization of the kingdom of God upon the face of the earth. God's people living in righteousness, no rich, no poor, no lonely, no discouraged. Nobody dying of diseases that we don't understand. From the time I was a child old enough to understand I had that vision, that dream, that goal of seeing that city of Zion upon the earth. Not like a fairy tale, but something real and tangible. A place where there's no sin, no more sorrow. I'm no longer a child. 
I'm rapidly becoming an old man if I'm not already there. And my heart breaks. My heart breaks for the years that have passed, the years that we have wasted, the years that we have spent thinking more of ourselves than we have of our Lord. Look at the, uh, the name of our congregation and the logo. We see the, the rainbow, even the name Living Hope conveys a message of promise and expectation of the realization and the fulfillment of that everlasting covenant. And yet, as every year goes by, it seems like we're moving in the wrong direction. It seems like we're further and further away from the realization of that promise that God has made to us. So what are we doing? Where are we going? What is stopping us from seeing that city here upon the face of this earth? We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We believe that when we went down into the waters of baptism, we gave our lives to him. And if we have given our lives to Jesus Christ, our lives are no longer our own but they belong to him to take or to preserve at his will. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm perfectly fine with that arrangement. And because my life is his and because your lives are his, how can we walk in fear? God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And he has called us to worship him in spirit and in truth. And I am convinced that worshiping him in spirit and in truth is the lives that we live, not only here on Sunday, but every day of the week. And I thought about that, and I thought, what if the person that cut me off in traffic that I was yelling at and honking, what do I do when that person walks through and I look out, I'm up here as a servant of God, and I look out and I see that person in the congregation how effective is my message? Have you ever been in the grocery store or at a department store and, and there's somebody in front of you that's consuming all of the cashier's time and, and arguing and, and delaying? Do you get frustrated? Do you sigh? Do you, will you hurry up? any number of things that situations that we face in our daily life that I'm afraid that if uh, the person that we are interacting with out in public sees us here, they're probably going to say, those people are a bunch of hypocrites. I really don't want much to do with them.
Jesus was asked, and it's recorded in Matthew in the 22nd chapter, the 35th to the 39th verses, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, and on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. It didn't say that love is the only commandment and we can forget all the rest of them. Jesus, when he encountered people, he said, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. He didn't say, I love you, so it's okay to continue in your sins. If we truly love God, if we truly love our neighbor, how could we ever break any of the commandments? How could we ever sin? You know, there have been an awful lot of times that I've had to do some real hard soul searching looking at myself and I'm Lord what's stopping me I'm not even worried about you guys what's stopping me and you know what he showed me he showed me that it's pride it's how highly I think of myself that keeps me from being the kind of man that he has called me to be. There have been times that I have, you know, I'm not interested in doing that. I want, I want guaranteed results. I'm, not ti I'm tired. I don't want to see any more failed experiments in, in Zionic living. I want to see results. Shortly after I made that statement, my, uh, my attention was drawn to the uh, third chapter of Genesis. And uh, this is the, uh, the encounter between when Satan was cast out. And I want you to listen to this, and, and I want you to listen real close to the words of Satan and also the words of Christ. And he came before me saying, Behold, I send me, I will be thy son, I will redeem all mankind, that one soul shall not be lost, and surely I will do it. Wherefore, give me thine honor. But behold, my beloved son, which was my beloved and chosen from the beginning, said unto me, Father, thy will be done and the glory be thine forever. Wherefore, because that Satan rebelled against me and sought to destroy the agency of man, which I, the Lord God, had given him, and also that I should give unto him mine own power, by the power of my only begotten, I caused that he should be cast down, and he became Satan. Yea, even the devil, the father of all lies, to deceive and to blind men, to lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken unto my voice. So you see, when I start thinking real highly of myself, when I start focusing on me and how horrible the world has treated me, I'm following the example of Satan. But when I look to the glory of God and seek to serve him and to serve his people, then I follow the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
What is your vision of that city? I'm not looking for answers. I want you to think about it. What does it look like when you walk down the streets of Zion? You know, as a, a surveyor, somebody that has uh, worked with engineers all my life, I think in terms of what are the streets paved with? Are there potholes? Is there electricity? Is there running water? Is there a sewage treatment plant in Zion? You know, a lot of the things that we just take for granted, we somehow think, you know, that the laws of physics are going to be suspended and uh, that those things will no longer matter. What are the things that we accept in our society as normal? Where will the divorce lawyer be in Zion? How many political parties will there be? How many different denominations of churches will there be in Zion? He is calling us to be his people with no schisms, with no separation, with no division. And yet we divide, and we argue, and we fight. The other day I was looking through some of the files on my computer and I pulled up an old priesthood roster from way back when I first started doing the scheduling. And I looked through that list and realized that well over half of the men on that list no longer attend here and only a few of them because they have passed on. Somehow, folks, we have got to get to the point where we stop dividing when we have differences. We need to come together, love each other enough that we can work these things out. As long as it's easier to pack up our toys and go on down the road and find someplace else and find people that agree with us a little better. We're never going to see that city. But we're so different. I'd like to use an example of, uh, of a choir. Whenever I get a chance, I like to sing with the choir when I have time. You might guess I sing bass. Can you imagine if I was so jealous of the Sopranos because I just love their music that I insisted on singing soprano? Or what about if Rhonda picks out a beautiful hymn song that we practice and we stand up to sing, and that's not my favorite hymn, that's not my favorite song, so I start singing whatever song I want to sing. God has made us different. He has given each one of us different talents, different strength, different abilities. And just like a choir, the different parts blend together in a beautiful harmony. He didn't make us different to envy each other. He doesn't make the soprano more right than the bass. They are both important parts of a beautiful choir. Can you imagine a choir in front of the throne of God? Thousands and thousands of voices 
singing in the most exquisite harmony, not a voice off key, not a word mispronounced, absolute perfection. Can you see the artist and the craftsman offering their gifts and the colors of the art blending with the notes of the choir, adding to that harmony, that utter perfection. And the carpenter and the laborer Every skill, every craft, every talent offered before the throne of God, adding to and blending with the harmony of that choir. You see the faces of the choir? Do you see anybody lonely? Do you see anybody sad? Do you see anybody dying from disease? What are we going to do, folks? Are we going to keep on, keep it on, satisfied with the way we've been doing things? Is it because that we are imperfect and flawed that we hesitate to serve God and serve each other? If that was the case, I would certainly not be here this morning. There are men that are much more eloquent much more spiritual, much better studied in the scriptures. But I believe there was somebody who said, I am slow of speech, and but a lad, and the people mock me. In fact, there was somebody else who said I was slow of speech. Somebody said, I'm a man of unclean lips, wherefore am I thy servant? God is used to working with some flawed, broken, rusty tools and doing some magnificent work. It is because of our flaws and imperfections that when that marvelous work is done, we give him the honor and the glory and cannot take it upon ourselves. There was a time when I was thinking about why, why so many of our number have been sick and died and thought, wouldn't it be great if the elders would rise up in their power and the authority of their priesthood and that everyone that we laid our hands upon would rise up and be well. And yet, which one of you if you knew that every person that you laid your hands upon was going to immediately be healed and made whole. How many of you, because of your ego, would start thinking mighty highly of yourself? Sure, at first, we would be able to give God the glory and the credit But I fear because 
of my weaknesses, that God has been merciful. Because I'm afraid that if that gift was mine, that my soul would be in jeopardy of hell because I don't think my ego would be able to contain it. Shame on me. Shame on all of us that we think more of ourselves than we think of our God and we think of our fellow man. It's easy enough. We can follow God or we can continue to listen to the lie because that's the only thing the adversary has to offer us. We can follow God and he gives us the promise of immortality and eternal life. Or we can follow Satan and all he has to offer is a lie and death. It's our choice. It's really quite simple. Rise up, O church of God. Be done with lesser things. For God has called you to be a people to show the world that his word is real and that his promises are true. It's not a fairy tale. Are you with me? Or we will hang our set and tell you that's too difficult, that's too tough. Or will we move forward to fulfill our promise and vision that he gave to us? Thank you. I'm thankful for the message that God has uh, placed in Rick's heart this day that he shared with us and the challenge he's put to each and every one of us in this room and those that uh, Rick has come in contact with. I know. Rick has a desire to serve the Lord, as each and every one of you do. God has put a message in your heart that you might share that gift of salvation to others you come in contact with. Yes, we are imperfect in a lot of things we do and say, but yet God is more powerful than anything we can imagine, and he can work a great miracle and a wonder in our lives. And in closing, I had a scripture I want to share with you. It comes from Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And it reads as this, wherefore, see we also are encompassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is before us. And always focusing on who it is we are focused on, and that is for looking into Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despite the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Thank you.